I caught the planning bug in Vancouver, of all places. Uh, I had graduated from uh, Western with a degree in English and philosophy. I was newly married. I thought I was going to go to law school. I was living in Vancouver, and there were all these people traveling around these city, these crazy people, most of them decked out in spandex, on their bikes. And I thought, that's very interesting. Maybe I should try cycling to work. It had never really occurred to me prior to that. And I started cycling, and I have been cycling ever since. I caught that bug in Vancouver. And there was also a lot of unrest in the media and conversation about the Woodwards building in the downtown east side. And I went to a forum uh, where a poet, uh, Bud Osborne, who's now deceased, he had lived on the street for many years, was speaking about housing in the downtown east side. And I went to that forum and I was completely intrigued and engaged with the question of how we negotiate our values in the city and who gets what and who matters and who doesn't matter and how we organize ourselves in order to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to flourish. And a few weeks after that, I was at a party and I was speaking to a young man who some of you may know. His name is Tamim Rad. And he looked at me, he, he uh, most recently worked for TransLink, and he looked at me and he said, are you a planner? And I honestly looked back at him. I was already a university graduate at this point, I'm ashamed to say. I looked back at him and said, what's a planner? <laughs> I had no idea, absolutely no idea. And he said to me, uh, go read Jane Jacobs, Life and Death. So I did. I went home, I got Jane Jacobs, Life and Death, I read it and I was home. So I took a few courses at the School of Community and Regional Planning and I um, fell in love with what has become my profession. And one of the things that I've loved about my profession is in fact the complexity. There are so many different things that we have the opportunity to touch as planners. And what I'd like to do in this presentation today, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm taking a card from Larry Beasy's playbook, and I'm in fact not going to show you slides. I'm going to talk to you today. And what I'd like to do is talk to you today about what I think is the most critical question in planning practice. And it's captured in many ways by the importance of that task force and the role of CIP. And it's the question of the role that planners play as leaders in city building. And I believe this is such a critical question precisely because the challenges we face are so complex and because there's an urgency to the work that we do. And that urgency continues to grow exponentially. And I should tell you that I really couldn't give this presentation four years ago. I can give it today in part because of my experience now in the public sector as a chief planner in the city of Toronto. I've begun to experiment and try new things and I've begun to build some evidence and data around what works and what doesn't work. And I'll talk a little bit in my presentation about some of those examples. So in some ways I'm going to present to you a theory today and I'm going to pepper it with that evidence and my hope is that we can begin as a profession to build a shared truth, maybe a starting point as we continue to build and define our professional planning practice, which quite frankly, even though CIP has been around for 100 years, is still in its infancy. We're still figuring out where to put our feet on the ground and how to put one foot in front of the other. Because, at the very least, planning practice is tricky. Uh, we, of course, have a professional obligation to serve the public interest, uh, to bring forward recommendations that are based on due diligence and evidence and data and analysis. But at the same time, we know that great places are nuanced. They are evolving, that there are many, many players and that at times, uh, in fact frequently, there are many competing interests that we need to negotiate and inevitably mistakes will be made. So it raises the question, how as planners will we lead in this process? And really this is the uh, heart of the investigation um, in the context of this presentation that I'm going to make to you today. We know that central to promoting livable communities is in many ways the task of what I'd like to call bridging the divide between great planning practice over here and political decision making. And we know there's a divide. If there wasn't a divide, our cities would look exactly as we think they should. But they don't, right? We know in theory certain things should happen and our city should look a certain way. 
And then in reality, there's all the things that happens on the ground. And our role, in fact, as planners, I believe, is to bridge that divide. And it's pretty important that we agree on this premise that there is a divide, in part because my presentation is, in fact, about leading uh, to bridge that divide. Our communities do not fully represent what we know is required to create livable, sustainable, prosperous places for all. We have an affordable housing crisis in this country. We have a weather crisis on this planet. Our cities are part of the solution, but they also have been a critical part of the problem. The opportunity for us to be transformative in the work that we, ever do, we do every day continues to grow exponentially as the role of cities becomes better recognized and understood in mitigating some of the greatest challenges facing humanity today. Now, some of you in the room may have in the past had uh, an experience in your organization, maybe as a senior planner or a manager or a division head. Someone in your organization has in fact suggested to you that the recommendation that you're bringing forward isn't in fact palatable, that you need to change your position in order to make your position more palatable in the public domain. And I'm not talking here about repositioning because we all need to reposition what we do at time to time. That's, that's simply good practice in terms of being strategic. But we, you may have had an experience where you've been told to change your position, and sometimes this happens in subtle ways, such as being asked for your opinion on a matter and then seeing your opinion edited out of a report because it wasn't politically expedient. Or maybe you've done great work. Maybe it's even been over many, many years and you made what you knew to be a very strong recommendation only to see council ignore that recommendation, go in a completely different direction because it was politically expedient. I have this experience all the time in the city of Toronto where uh, you know, I look at what used to be employment lands along the Gardner Expressway, then now there's uh, condos or townhomes that have been built cheek and jowl with the Gardner Expressway, and I look at it and I say, how did that happen? It was not a planning recommendation. It's not good planning. It's not good community building. It's not good use of employment lands to be throwing up row houses. But it happened because there was a political interest or political interference that was not in the broader public interest that in fact won the day. So really the most important evidence of all that there is a divide between we know what should happen and what actually happens is the kinds of cities and communities that we are in fact building. I'm going to get to the positive stuff in a minute, just so stick with me. Uh, we claim to be building sustainable cities, but of course we know we're not quite. Uh, it's not what we see on the ground. Um, we claim to be building cities for all, and if you look at most municipalities in Canada and their mission statements, there's something about sustainability and there's something about housing for all, but we know that the reality is in fact quite different. We know that designing for complete communities where people have the option to walk to work and to walk to undertake the activities of daily life is not only critical to building strong communities, where people thrive because they feel connected and have a sense of belonging, we also know that those kinds of communities are our best hope for mitigating climate change. But is that the predominant nature of our cities in Canada? Well, we know it's not. In part, we have some great data generated by Professor David Gordon from Queen's University uh, where he looked at the growth in Canada over the course of the past generation and he in fact identifies a whole series of different types of communities and in particular he puts them into various typologies and he identifies point blank that Canada is a suburban nation that 82 percent of the population in Canada doesn't live in those walkable urban cores 82 percent of the population in Canada is living in car-oriented suburban communities. One of his typologies is transit-oriented suburbs. That's different. But in fact, the vast majority of our growth over the course of the past generation has been in auto-oriented suburban communities. 
At the more detailed level, just to take a very specific example, we know that integrating stormwater management into our street design enhances quality of life by mitigating stormwater flows at the source and by creating closed loop systems, which in turn enhances the thriving of our urban trees and street side vegetation, thereby further creating higher air quality, better air quality, mitigating climate change in our most urban environments. We know all of that theoretically, but in fact, is that what we are doing in practice? In fact, it's the exception, the instances where we're doing that. It's not the status quo. And the objective really should be, if we could bridge that divide, would be to make those green infrastructure investments the status quo. So as a matter of practice, the cities we are building are really a far cry from what we know intellectually is required to create sustainable places. Now, of course, the scale of this divide varies from cities to city, in part because the players are different and the interests are different from city to city. But in the end, these are examples and evidence, really, that the divide does exist between planning theory and planning practice. And this is our great challenge, I believe, as city builders, is to figure out how to bridge that divide. And I believe bridging that divide will come through our leadership as a profession. The risk is, if we don't focus on bridging this divide, we in fact become a little bit trapped. We lessen our aspirations for our planning work because we don't have the confidence or we don't have the belief that the gulf between professional practice and politics can in fact be bridged. Now, depending on the magnitude of this gulf, we sometimes make little adjustments. We twist and we position ourselves just so without even realizing that we begin to lose our grip somewhat on our vision. We incrementally reposition ourselves so carefully, so subtly, that we forget what our position might be if we weren't immersed in a political context that presents all kinds of constraints to what we do every day, we compromise what we believe to be achievable. We think our city is different. It's harder in my city. It's more difficult. The politics are more difficult than they are here than elsewhere. And that's why in our city, the outcomes might be different. That's why our aspirations might look slightly maligned. And we do have tools to bridge the gap that we do embrace all the time. The most common tool, I think, is the least effective. And the most common tool is that we sort of loosen the reins on the vision. We step back from what we know in theory we ought to be doing. We step back from our idealism, from our belief that achieving a great city or community is, in fact, possible. That is one way to bridge the gap. But I also think it's dangerous. And I also think it's reflected in many of our communities across Canada. It's reflected in my city. Its consequences are far-reaching and fundamentally undermine the overall integrity of our expertise as professionals. In fact, it's a way of bridging the divide that simply sort of blurs the lines between politics and professional practice. And I would just like to add a point of clarification here because, as you can probably appreciate, I get accused all the time of being too political. Um, and I want to be very clear, it's not political to give voice consistently, steadily, and appropriately to your professional opinion that is well-researched, supported, and defended by evidence and rooted in the public interest. It is, in fact, political to compromise your professional opinion to assist with a political agenda. And it's important to have clarity on this point. So I want you to ask yourself something. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a theoretical exercise here, so just bear with me. Imagine for a moment that you hold the magic wand, that you're not only the planner but also the decision maker about how your community will be planned and designed. Imagine that there's no political context for decision making. We know this isn't reality. That's why I want you to imagine. Imagine that you are planning and designing a city constraint-free exactly as you believe in this moment. 
knowing that you will learn and adapt and change as you move through ex execution, that's inevitable, but knowing that you have the free reign to do so. Linger in that idea that you can do what you want, that you can build the city of your dreams. Now imagine a project that you're working on today. Imagine that no political process exists to implement the good policy or good design or good infrastructure that you know is required. Now ask yourself this, what would you be doing differently? How would your aspirations change? Would I give different advice? Let me give you a very specific example from my planning practice. Now, some of you may be aware that we have a bit of a debate going on around transit in our city. And uh, under the last administration, there was a subway that was approved to replace an LRT line that was going to be built by the province in Scarborough. Now, we've been directed by city council to implement this subway. Now recently, I asked my planning team, knowing that I was going to have to bring the environmental assessment back to City Council, I pulled back and asked my transit planning team, let's actually forget about the politics for a minute, let's forget about the decision that's been made, and let's ask this question. What does good, what does great transit planning look like in Scarborough. This was me pausing in everyday life to wave the magic wand, to step back from the constraints of the everyday context that I work in, and think in an aspirational way about the best interests of the overall city. Now, it's interesting what happened in this instance, because my team went away and came up with a much better plan. Now, I had, of course, a political problem, because the previous plan had been supported by city council. But I had a mayor who had made it very clear that he was interested in evidence and database decision making. So we built up the planning rationale around this new proposal for transit in Scarborough and brought it to the mayor's office and we pitched it. We said this is better planning, this is better transit planning than what has already been approved in Scarborough for transit. And the mayor looked at it. He studied the rationale, he read the background documents, including the data that we brought forward around trip patterns and how people already move, and he said, you're right, I'm going to champion this. And I'm really thrilled to say that last month, City Council supported that new plan 38 to 1. So you know what's interesting about this story? We could have twisted ourselves in knots to implement a plan that in fact needed refinement. And instead we paused, waved the magic wand, became aspirational, and then worked it backwards to move it through the political process. Idealism is critical in our planning practice. Asking the question made it very clear to me, and this is a, a really good case study, that there's a risk in our planning practice if we're not continually going back to our aspirations. In fact, I think we have, a, we have a professional obligation to continually be moving back from planning practice to our aspirations despite the constraints of everyday planning. I went back to my team and I put a question to them. We went back to first principles. We wanted to ensure that we could provide council with the absolute best advice and we were able to do that. Now, we know that planning is not an idealized practice where we have the authority or the right as planners to plan in absolute terms. However, we know that's only really ever been the case with totalitarian regimes. However, I believe we are bound every day on every project by a multitude of considerations that are necessary in a democratic society. And this is of course critical. It means that planning is messy it means that it is challenging. And in fact, there were many in the organization who did not support bringing forward a new transit plan to council because it seemed like we were reopening a debate that had already been closed. But it was in the public interest to do so. Planning is fraught with tensions that need to be negotiated, navigated, and ultimately embraced. Many years ago, a mentor once said to me, 
Leaders grab nettles. They reach their hand out and they grab them and they disentangle them. We must do so as a planning practice because planners operate at the center of a whole variety of necessary tensions in a democratic society. We negotiate complex and competing interests. Take, for example, the long-term versus short-term interests. Well, for example, in the short term, building new housing stock in the floodplain would increase the housing in a city, often in a scenic area where there might be a wonderful view of a, of a river. It will provide a benefit to the developers who will argue for the desire of that housing for the public to have more housing in the area. It will also increase the assessment base for the city. These are, of course, short-term considerations. As we learned in the city of Toronto during Hurricane Hazel, and more recently in Calgary, when 26 neighborhoods had to be evacuated due to flooding, many of which were in floodplains, there is a longer term quality of life consideration, that being having to live with the constant threat of flooding as the water table continues to rise in many communities and include throughout, including throughout all of Alberta, as well as a national interest $30 billion came out of our national coffers to assist because we built flooding in a housing, in a, in a floodplain. That was poor, a poor decision. As planners, we have a unique burden not carried by many stakeholders, and it is this. We are stewards of the land, stewards of our city, but we're also stewards of future generations. We must continually be pushing up and bumping up against short-term interests that are not in the interests of future generations. All planners have an obligation to serve the public interest, and we ought to be engaged in a continuous and rigorous debate about what that public interest is on every project, because it's messy, and it's often not immediately evident. It's also imperative to differentiate our role from politicians. Politicians, too, in theory and in practice, serve the public interest. We are public servants alike, whether we play an administrative role or a political one. When I first came to the City of Toronto, I, in fact, had a big debate over a very specific planning application with a well-known politician who insisted to me that his position was aligned with the public interest, and since as a planner I have to uh, implement the public interest that I should adopt his position on this file. There was a certain logic to what he was saying, but of course it was a wild oversimplification. And after a significant amount of debate, we came to a point where he was willing to agree that the public interest can be defined in many ways and that as a ward-based councillor, he was representing the interests of the constituents who live today, not future generations, but who live today in that ward and who in, live in that ward specifically, whereas I had an obligation to think about the city as a whole and regional considerations. Very different. We need to have these conversations about what the public is, interest is and how it gets represented in our planning practice. So what I'd like to do to wrap up this presentation is to walk through what I would like to call four characteristics, and I'll go through some examples with respect to these characteristics that are embraced by planners who lead in their planning practice. The first is planners who lead build constituencies for progressive city building, and they do that in part by working outside of the box. The extent to which we can generate alignment between a whole variety of different interests will in fact shape our cities. This is about creating a shared consensus. And you can never have a shared consensus if you do not create a broadly shared vision. And getting there demands ongoing engagement and discourse. I have been uh, questioned many times for the very public approach that I've taken to my role as chief planner. It's not frivolous. It's essential to being able to advance progressive ideas for city building. Building a shared consensus is a critical part of shaping the future city. I was amazed a couple of years ago, I went to Melbourne and I discovered that you know Melbourne has been widely recognized as the most livable city in the world. 
that a significant amount of investment is being made in a 400 series type highway system all around Melbourne in order to significantly expand the suburbs. And there was in fact a big debate going on in Melbourne about whether or not there should be more investment in transit or more investment in highway system. And in fact, I was speaking at a round table. One of the first questions I got from the floor from a community leader was, in your opinion, should we spend more money on highways or more money on transit? We haven't figured that out yet. That shared consensus didn't exist. But what's really interesting to me, and this is why it's good to go away, is that I realized we've actually crossed that threshold, not only in Toronto, not only in, uh, in BC, but across the country. Show me a mayor who doesn't have a transit agenda in this country. We broadly recognize that transit is a critical part of creating livable, sustainable cities and mitigating climate change. We've crossed that threshold. Now we have another big threshold to cross and build a shared consensus around, which is how to pay for it. That's a very important conversation to have. But we've crossed the first threshold. We're not having the same conversation that they're having in Melbourne. Oh, highways or transit, which is it? We're not having that conversation. We're having the conversation about how to pay. We now need to build a shared consensus around how to pay for our transit in, in infrastructure. I believe that this shared consensus that we have around the importance of transit in our country, and remember, in most provinces, we have all levels of government. I know that's the case in Ontario. The province is also very much focused on transit. We know the federal government has identified transit as a key priority. This is the outcome of a robust, intentional, strategic conversation about good planning and the role that transit plays in facilitating the livable city. This didn't happen. Planners and others have built constituencies who believe and recognize the critical role that transit plays in our cities. In the Toronto region, for example, the Board of Trade has conducted all kinds of research and demonstrated the negative impact on productivity that congestion has and has also demonstrated how investment in transit is critical to the economic performance of the region. In doing so, they reached out to new constituencies and began building support among new constituencies for investing in transit. Civic action is a collaboration between uh, corporate executives and not-for-profit leaders. Civic action in the GTA has also built constituencies both among, corp among corporate executives as well as emerging leaders around the importance of investing in transit. So the constituencies in this dialogue around transit has been intentional, it's been focused, it's been robust, and the outcomes have been good. Now we're on the cusp of having another conversation and we need to continue to build constituencies that support investing in transit. Now, sometimes the gap is very narrow between what we ought to do and the infrastructure that we need to build or that we are building. We in fact need to recognize those instances where building constituencies for an idea has resulted in changed outcomes. Vancouver is a really good, a really good example of building constituencies that support higher density living in some areas. Having conversations about the shape and form of our city and how it aligns with our vision as a society is the key mechanism that we use to bridge the gap and to lead in planning practice. In my work, in an attempt to build constituencies for progressive planning, I've embraced a whole series of tools. Twitter, Twitter is actually a really excellent way to catch the attention of mainstream media. It's been an important uh, tool for that. Chief Planner Roundtables. This is where I've had the opportunity to bring in a whole variety of different players and stakeholders into City Hall, hall and hold in-depth conversations about the biggest challenges that we face, such as becoming a resilient city, such as how we transform our suburbs to become more livable and more sustainable. These conversations are live streamed and they're in depth and they're about building our capacity within the bureaucracy to be extremely thoughtful in our policy development.
I also have a blog called Own Your City. This is about having a platform where I can speak directly to various audiences about complex and contentious issues. I've also written a multitude of op-eds in the Toronto Star and a few as well in the Globe and Mail, also one in the Ottawa Citizen. This is about reaching mainstream audiences who would never attend a planning meeting, who would never come to a public open house, but who of course have a shared interest in the way our cities are planned and designed. I've also just recently launched a podcast called Invisible City. It's invisiblecitypodcast.com is where you can find the podcast. This podcast was an intentional strategy to reach out to millennials. Millennials are huge into podcasts. Last year, May 2-4 weekend, I was sitting around with a bunch of my 20-something nephews talking about how millennials just don't give a hoot about planning and asking them how they thought I could start bringing millennials, those between the ages of 18 and 34, into a discourse about the future city, building that shared interest. It's also a demographic that doesn't vote. And one of my nephews said, well, why don't you launch a podcast? And I went around the room. I had like six nieces and nephews in the room. I literally went around the room. Do you listen to podcasts? Yes. Do you? Oh, yeah. Do you? Oh, yeah, all the time. I'd never listened to a podcast a year ago. I now have six episodes. InvisibleCity.com is all about building a constituency about city building, for city building, that can advocate progressive ideas. And one of the other things that we've done in city planning is we've also launched a series of short videos. Very short videos in some instances, 30 seconds or a minute and a half. One of those videos, DT Advice, which we launched about six weeks ago to uh, draw people into our downtown planning exercise, uh, got 25,000 hits. That's the good news. The bad news is it got widely slagged, which is why it got so many hits. The funny thing is, including by Huffington Post, you have to Google it. It's called DT, DT Advice. You have to Google this video because the Huffington Post wrote an article saying that um, DT advice is another reason for Canada to hate Toronto. <laughs> now, this should have really hurt my feelings, but as someone who really cares about bringing people into the conversation about the work they're doing, I thought it was hysterical. And in fact, what we launched two days ago is a mean tweets video where city staff and a city councillor read the mean tweets that people wrote about our video. We thought, hey, let's keep the spin going because our goal is to draw people into our planning process. You might want to take a look at both of them. When you experiment, you sometimes fail. That's one of the lessons here. So that's the first key way or characteristic, I think, of planners who lead is that they focus on building constituencies that will support ideas and drive those ideas forward. The second is planners who lead Negotiate outcomes with clarity of vision. There are times when we need to be flexible, and there are times where we shouldn't. There are times when to shift our position fundamentally undermines the vision of the city that we are seeking to create. Our vision and values must guide the everyday negotiations that are inevitable as we go about our city building. Now, the case study, that's a wonderful case in point for the importance of having clarity of vision, in fact, in the Toronto context for me, is of course the Gardner Expressway debate. It's very difficult to have a different position than your mayor. It's very difficult to have a different position than many of your very strong lobbyist groups in your city, like the Canadian Automobile Association. But if in fact you have clarity about the vision of the city, not only that you are seeking to create, but in the Toronto context that is embedded in official plan policy, it becomes easy in the face of that opposition to hold your ground. And I don't want to imply that it was not a trying experience to speak out publicly about the longer term public interest of the city in in fact removing the eastern portion of the Gardner Expressway because it was very trying, it was a very difficult thing to do. But it wasn't a difficult thing to do because it was so straightforward, because the clarity around the vision of the city we're trying to create 
is very strong. And because it's strong, it really was a no-brainer. It was not a radical thing. And ironically, the mayor has since said that he recognizes it would have been a radical thing for the chief planner to have supported that position. Because the vision of the city that we have is so clear. And it would have been deviant to have suggested otherwise as the chief planner, despite the political pressure. The extent to which we can use data and evidence to inform our negotiations, to propel us towards that larger vi uh, vision, will in fact assist in bridging that divide in our most complex negotiation. But planners who lead negotiate always with that clarity of vision as the ultimate outcome that they are seeking to achieve. The third way that I believe planners lead is by embracing complexity. If we look at the mistakes made in our urban, urban environment, they're typically related to an oversimplification. If we look at a suburban, typical suburban community, it is an oversimplification. Uh, the very first thing that we do in a traditional suburb is we clear the land. We make all the land the same. It's actually really complex to say, you know what, there's rivers and streams and trees, trees and streams and we're going to plan around them. An oversimplification is to say, let's make this land like all the other land. Let's clear cut it and overlay a plan that you could put anywhere. That's the first part of the oversimplification. The second part is one housing typology. In our most traditional suburbs, we assume that every family is a mom and dad and two kids. Well, we know that's hugely wrong, that that's not all, at all the case but we build one housing typology, assuming that families are all the same. Another oversimplification. The third thing we do is we assume everyone's going to own a car and move in the same way. Well, of course that's not true. If we plan differently, as we've seen in places where we have, people will choose to walk, people will choose to cycle, people will choose to take transit if we plan for it. Planning practice demands a tremendous amount of thoughtfulness in part because we need to recognize connectivity and diversity in our places as urban systems. Now our job is not to create an overly rigid environment, but to create the settings and environment that allow for new uses, new creativity to emerge. This is a complex thing to do, it's not easy. The collision of people and things creates exciting, livable, entrepreneurial spaces and places that are connected and that also connect people. In order to do this, we need to look at our old buildings, our heritage infrastructure. It's much easier to tear those buildings down, but it's not better. We must embrace the complexity of figuring out how to preserve and enhance and adapt our heritage resources. It's not easy, it's complex, but it results in better, more dynamic places. Part of our challenge is to find the balance between guiding frameworks and at the same time to identify how flexibility and nuance can be a part of our planning practice. There are some areas where rigidity and order is required. Heritage conservation districts are really an example that comes to mind. We do need to know as planners when to bend the rules and it's critical to our planning practice that we know when we shouldn't bend the rules, when we should hold our ground. Doing so is complex. Now, the last way that I'd like to suggest that planners lead is by recognizing that planner is in fact an expert. Planners are not simply facilitators. This has been a really vogue idea, the planner as a facilitator. Uh, the notion that every idea is a good idea, it's not true. We know that's not true. <laughs> There's lots of terrible ideas. And in fact, planner as expert uses data and evidence to call out the bad ideas, to engage in that robust dialogue about what is in the larger public interest. The facilitator sits back and in fact allows a variety of different parties to have their say without engaging and leading the conversation. Well, I would like to suggest that planners who lead come to the table reclaiming their expertise, expertise, knowing their expertise, 
and using it in the development of knowledge about cities. And this is why the interface between academia and planning practice is so critical. We must be collaborating in a dynamic and fluid way with our colleagues in academia. There needs to be an iteration, the building of knowledge, given that our planning pra practice is complex and we are continually learning. I actually think that this notion of the planner as a facilitator has undermined our professional credibility. It's led to problematic outcomes. It's hurt our cities and our communities. Tower in the Park is a really good example of a bad idea that was allowed to proliferate that now needs to be remediated. The moment that that key fundamental premise of great urbanism, the notion that buildings need to have a strong relationship to the street, the moment that was broken through Tower in the Park, we started to create hostile living places in our most urban environments that were only car oriented and no longer walkable. Understanding urbanism means calling out the bad ideas. Jane Jacobs, of course, who last week would have celebrated her 100th birthday, saved many of our cities by being a leader and speaking out. She, in fact, stopped through her ideas and her activism the tearing up of many of our cities through the embracing of expressways. Now, just picture this for a moment, right? Expressways were modern. They were efficient. They were the future. It was bold to stand up and say, uh-uh, they're wrong. They're a mistake. They will compromise the very thing, nuance and detail and the specificity of place. Expressways will compromise that very idea. That was a bold thing to do. That was the embracing of the role of the planner as a leader who in fact brought data and evidence and in Jane Jacobs' instance that came from observing places that really worked and were very effective places. We need to continually call out the fact that we are making choices as a society about what we value, about what matters, about how resources will be shared. I have a podcast on autonomous vehicles and in that podcast I call that out because there's this idea that autonomous vehicles will somehow be good for cities or will somehow be bad for cities. Well, they're inherently neither. Autonomous vehicles will be good for cities if we choose to integrate them in such a way that we do not lose sight of our vision of creating sustainable, walkable, people-oriented places. If we lose sight of that vision and we see autonomous vehicles as a tool for something else, just a different sort of long commute, we've made a different choice. It's just like transit isn't always good. Sometimes transit is administered very poorly in our cities. It's a choice and it's complex. And our role as planners is to lead that conversation and that dialogue by calling out the fact that we are making choices that relate to values that align with different kinds of visions of the city. We have an obligation to really understand the implications of planning policy and land use development, in particular for our most vulnerable residents. We have a role at the table to represent those who may not have a voice or who are yet unborn. The planner as an expert is also a leader, readily identifying and making transparent the underlying truths that ought to inform our planning rationales. I believe that's our role and it's effective when we do so in collaboration with a whole variety of other constituencies. As planners, we have a professional obligation to serve the public interest. Of course, we must bring forward sound recommendations that are based on data analysis and best practices. Sometimes we think we are inventing the wheel when we're not. We know things from what we see in other cities around us. At the same time, 
our most sustainable cities and our most livable cities are, are an outcome of recognizing that planning is in fact more art than science, although it is both. Great places are nuanced, they are evolving, they're prodded into being by many players with shared interests. They involve iterations, experimentation, and always, always negotiation. And planners have a role to play in leading this process. Thank you very much.